Hello. In this video, we'll talk about the Froster Resonance Energy Transfer or FRET. So in this video, we'll talk about the principles behind FRET, the applications and the limitations of FRET. So stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon. Fluorescence Resonance Energy Transfer is a mechanism where the energy gets transferred from one particular fluorophore, which is known as the donor, to the acceptor provided this donor and acceptor are within a particular close proximity. So here the donor is excited by a wavelength of light and the energy gets quickly transferred to the acceptor and then the acceptor starts fluorescing and this phenomenon is known as FRET. Now first of all we should understand that FRET is a non-radiative energy transfer and it happens due to non-radiative dipole-dipole coupling. So, FRET happens when these fluorophores are at very close proximity, at a distance roughly below than 10 nanometers. But when the distance between these molecules are greater than 10 nanometer or more, then FRET is not possible. So, let's try to understand uh, that what are the key factor that helps in the process of FRET. So FRET is a function of distance. If the distance increase, FRET would not happen. And the efficiency of FRET can be expressed by this formula, E equal to 1 by 1 plus R by R0, where small r is the distance between two fluorophore molecules, and R0 is a quantity that is characteristic distance where the FRET efficiency is 50%. And it's also a function of what type of FRET sensors we are using or the fluorophore couples that we are using. Now if you try to understand this from a graphical point of view, we can see the graph looks like this. So with the increase in the distance between two molecules, the FRET would be diminished or there would be almost no FRET. And the R0 is a property of the donor and acceptor pair. For example, if we use the cyan fluorescence protein and yellow fluorescence protein pair, then the R0 would be roughly around 4.72 nanometers. Now let's try to understand the Zablonsky diagram and the excitation and emission spectrum for FRET. So here is the excitation wavelength. So obviously the electrons would jump up to a higher ex excitation state then it should be a emission in a like radiative fashion but when the two molecules are close proximity there would be a fret transfer and thereby the fluorescence would be observed at a very higher wavelength in this case the wavelength is would be corresponding to yfp and we have stimulated the cyan fluorescence protein and we are getting a fluorescence correspond to the yellow fluorescence protein. So this is how we can understand the FRET diagram or the Zablonsky diagram for FRET. Now let's talk about how FRET is done in the lab. So in order to do FRET, we need to express the FRET constructs inside our cell or tissue. Let's say we want to study a protein-protein interaction using FRET assay. So we have expressed protein A with the cyan fluorescent protein and protein B with yellow fluorescence protein and then we have transfected both these expression plasmid into a cultured cell. Now obviously these expression plasmid would be expressed inside these cells and they would generate the proteins or the FRET constructs. Then using a fluorescence microscope we can image FRET in real time. So FRET-based calcium sensors are frequently used by neurobiologists. Here, we excite with a wavelength of 440 nanometers. And in this FRET sensor, you have a calmodulin moiety coupled with a M13 helix and the acceptor and donor pair. Here we have excited the acceptor with 440 nanometer wavelength light. Now these, as you can see in this image, these two acceptor and donor pair are pretty far apart. So FRET is not possible between them. Thereby, the emission would be 
at 475 nanometer and we would get an emission correspond to the cyan fluorescence protein. But when calcium is present, there would be a conformational change which would bring this M13 helix in a way that the CFP and the YFP come very close to each other. And under these circumstances, if we further excite the CFP with 440 nanometer, now instead of getting a fluorescent at 475 nanometer, we are going to get a fluorescence at 530 nanometer correspond to the YFP fluorescence. That means FRET occurred in this case because the two fluorophores are in close proximity. So in simple words, we can understand in absence of calcium, there would be no FRET, but in presence of calcium, there would be FRET. And this change would tell us about the presence of calcium in the cell. So, using this strategy, neuroscientists can really understand the calcium oscillations inside the neurons. Let's take another example. These FRET based sensors can be also useful to study signaling pathways. How is that? So, we are looking at the cyclic AMP sensor. In this case, we have excited with 440 nanometer and there is FRET happening because these two fluorophores are very close to each other. Notice that in this case, without even binding the cyclic AMP, the FRET is happening. But what really happens when cyclic AMP is bound? When cyclic AMP is bound, these there is a conformational change which results in this particular fluorophores to separate out from each other and the distance between them really increases. And in that case, if we excite the CFP with 440 nanometer, we are going to get a fluorescence at 475 instead of 530 nanometer. That means only the donor would show fluorescence. Now the acceptor is not showing any kind of fluorescence in this case. That simply means FRET didn't happen. So no FRET in this case means there is presence of cyclic AMP. So we can get both these scenarios that we have discussed so far, either the presence of FRET or the absence of FRET, both can tell us about something. Now this is a quite reversible process in this case. So let, let's try to contextualize in a signaling perspective. We can understand what really happens in G protein coupled receptor signaling. When ligand binds, the G alpha subunit gets dissociated and it, it's bound to GTP, which activates the adenylate cyclase, which leads to cyclic AMP production. Production of cyclic AMP could be taken as a readout for this signaling and downstream events would happen Therefore, so the cyclic AMP FRET sensor can tell us about the activity status of this signaling pathway. So when the ligand is absent and the pathway is not active, then there would be FRET. But when the pathway is active, the ligand is present, that means the cyclic AMP is generated in presence of cyclic AMP, there would be no FRET. So Presence or absence of FRET tells us about the on and off status of this particular signaling pathway. So that's amazing. So it's especially attractive to cell biologists because they can understand the output of a signaling pathway or the readout of a signaling pathway and they can measure it in a real time. It's a quantitative measurement. Now let's talk about the limitations of FRET. There are tons of limitations of FRET. First of all, the donor and acceptor fluorophore might exhibit different change in the different level of brightness and that could uh, lead to an error in the measurement. There could be also a bleed through which would lead to a fault in the FRET measurement. The time resolution is limited by the frame rate of the camera that would be used to measure FRET. So temporal resolution is always an issue. Photo bleaching and also requirement of special modifications of a microscope like specific uh, fluorescence filter is also a kind of limitation of this FRET, FRET assay. Despite of this limitation, what we, uh, what we understand from this video is that FRET is a really important tool in case of cellular and molecular biology to understand protein-protein protein, uh, uh, protein -protein interaction. Sometimes it can also report the signaling output or the presence of a particular uh, molecule like calcium in the cell. So it can be a bio biological sensor, it can be a signaling measurement readout, it can also 
tell us about the interaction or the proximity of two proteins. So I hope this video was useful. You can get all the notes and flashcards in the Facebook page. The link of the Facebook page is provided in the description. So don't forget to follow that. And as usual, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Do let me know in the comment whether you like my videos or not. You can support my channel in Patreon. And if you are an Indian viewer, you can support me via Bhim UPI app. My courses are also present in Unacademy, which is India's online learning platform. It's the biggest learning platform. By using my code AP10, you can get a 10% discount in that. Thanks for listening. See you in the next video.